So I'm Justin Ziemba. I'm the fellowship program director. Phil Muck Savage should be coming on any minute. He's the associate program director um, for the fellowship. Uh, we are both uh, endourology fellowship trained uh, from myself I did at Hopkins and Phil Muck Savage did at UC Irvine in California. Uh, but we'll get into our bios in a second. Uh, so thank you all again for coming. So let's just start with a little bit of our philosophy for what we hope to achieve through the fellowship. Uh, we think we have a very rich and diverse educational experience, um, and we've really put it together to make you all uh, who, who go through the fellowship as best as you, as best as you possibly can be in both uh, the practice, the advancement, and in the champion um, of minimally invasive surgery. And for us, that really is about where you ultimately want to practice. So if that is a community-based setting, we think that's great. There's uh, a lot of fellows out of this program who've gone and become experts in their local community um, and or academic urology. And so whatever is the best path for you and where you can make the most impact um, is what we ultimately want to get um, uh, for you. And so when we think about how we're going to be able to do this, um, is this is our objectives. So we have a few of them that we think we can achieve during this one year of fellowship. Uh, first of all, you guys all, most of you come in with a great baseline knowledge of uh, both the medical decision making, uh, the medical management, as well as the surgical technique and surgical management, management of urologic disease. But what we really want to do is let you take this year to gain uh, some more in-depth exposure uh, to the advanced management of some of these conditions. So when we're thinking about stones, we're thinking about uh, prostate and kidney cancer. Um, those are the areas where we think we can make uh, the biggest impact on your knowledge base. Um, and you can really become an expert in those areas um, and then take it back to either community or academic practice. Similarly, we really want you to spend as much time as possible mastering the surgical techniques of those. So that's uh, we're primarily thinking about robotics um, as well as percutaneous procedures. And then uh, we also feel that it's a great opportunity over the course of the year for you to get ready for independent practice. Um, and so there is a small clinic component where you manage your sort of own panel of patients. Uh, these are some return patients and some new patients as well, thinking about how you ultimately can develop your practice, how you manage your patients, um, how you do the workflow um, in a very controlled and limited setting. So then when you get into practice, um, you'll be able to hit the ground running and won't spend the first six or 12 months um, trying to figure that out. Um, and Jeff and, and Ryan can certainly speak to that because they've been doing that for um, a year and a half and half a year respectively. So you'll hear from them about um, hopefully that was a worthwhile experience. And then we also think that it's really important that you gain some additional um, research skills, um, whether that's uh, for the most part in clinical research um, or quality improvement, safety, value, any of those other areas where you might find alignment with your personal in interests. That's what we hope uh, you can achieve uh, during this year. And then finally, um, as is always discussed in medicine, but um, you know, strengthen your behavior of self-directed learning. So we really want you to spend time reading, uh, learning about areas of urology that are um, uh, important as well as uh, applicable to what you're doing on the day-to-day -day basis. So what's the framework and how are we gonna achieve, the, achieve these objectives? Well, we have a history of success. Um, and so Phil Mock Savage and I have been with the fellowship program for about four to five years, although in the last uh, year and a half to two to three years, we've taken ownership of the program as the previous fellowship director, David Lee, uh, departed. Um, and so uh, this is actually the longest or one of the longest uh, endourology fellowships in the country. It was started in 2005 and has continuously trained a fellow since that time. So we have a pretty successful track record. Um, we also think it's really important and particularly more so in the last few years that the fellow is fully integrated into the division of urology. Um, you are not uh, the fellow of myself or, or Phil Muck Savage or one of the other attendings. You are the endo urology fellow for the division. And so that means you play a, cl a critical role equal to much of the faculty. Um, and so we expect uh, that you're participatory, you're engaged. Um, not just in that moment in the case, but thinking about how can I improve the division? How can I be a better educator for the residents and medical students? Um, all that has to be an important component. 
Um, and then we have a very high clinical volume and acuity. Uh, we're one of the largest referral centers for the Delaware Valley, which is basically the tri-state area, half of Pennsylvania, most of Delaware, and the bottom half of New Jersey. Um, and so we get a large volume of patients that are usually very sick. Um, and so you have the opportunity to manage those, um, again, under supervision. And then practice-based learning we think is really important. So this is a fellowship where you actually get to do the case. Um, you're not here watching, uh, which can take place at some of the other programs around the country. We actually want you to get involved, have ownership, and actually participate in the surgical aspect, and then, um, you know, the management as well in clinic. And then finally, as I already stated, we think it's really important that you're fully integrated. And so each one of us on faculty, as well as the residents themselves, take uh, education, teaching, and mentorship very seriously. And so we feel that that is important for the fellow to do as well. And you're fortunate enough to sort of be in this transition period between leaving residency and taking a faculty job where you have a little bit more time. And so you can really think about on the days that you're in the operating room, you know, preparing educational materials or thinking about the case and how you can get the resident um, you know, engaged and teach them more about either the disease process or how to do the surgical aspect of the case, the technical aspects. So that's kind of our framework and, and the pillars of our program and our educational philosophy. So I wanted to take just a few minutes to go over the clinical sites because we have three and they're somewhat varied and diverse. And then I'll put the faculty names next to there um, and we'll go over in faculty introductions in a second, but just so you know who goes and belongs with with each site, although there is some, some crossover. Um, and the nice thing about this program is you get a different flavor depending on the different sites you go to. So this, these two sites are our main academic center. Um, this is sort of our main university hospital, our quaternary referral center. Um, this is our largest clinical footprint, just opened a new hospital, which is on the bottom there called the Pavilion uh, on October 31st. Um, there's a few billion dollars, um, massive amount of space. Um, you know, one of these high-tech hospitals, uh, we're slowly getting used to that. It's directly connected to the hospital above that, which is the legacy hospital, still has beds. That's where our urology patients are housed for, for inpatient purposes, but we operate in the new operating rooms in the pavilion, which is the lower part. Um, and so this is a, a exciting time uh, to be part of Penn because of all the, the growth. Um, I myself am one of the faculty members that's at that site, Tom Guzzo, who you'll meet with, who's our division chief, uh, also there, and Daniel Lee, who is texting me that he's still in the operating room, unfortunately. Um, so hopefully he'll get on for the end of the talk, but he straddles both here and, and Presbyterian, which is our next site. So this is also more or less become a tertiary care center. Um, it does also treat the West Philadelphia population as kind of their primary um, hospital as well, so both community and sort of academic uh, high acuity um, urology. Our trauma center is here as well, and uh, so this is a slightly smaller hospital, but by no means a, a, a sort of uh, community-based hospital, although you do get uh, much of the West Philadelphia community, which is underserved by and large, um, uses this as their primary site. So a lot of bread and butter urology here, as well as a lot of um, robotics and, and high acuity urology as well. Phil Parazio is, is on tonight. Um, he is one of our new faculty additions. Um, he's the chief at this uh, clinical site and uh, he operates there and Dan Lee um, spends time there as well. So both of those are faculty you'll operate with. Pennsylvania Hospital is our as close to our community uh, hospital as, as we get in the health system. Uh, still more, much closer to an academic um, facility than it is your, your basic bread and butter uh, community hospital. Um, it's actually the nation's first hospital um, for historical purposes. That's a shot of the uh, Physic Garden, which uh, has been there since I think around the late 1700s. Um, Philip Muxavich, who's the Associate uh, Fellowship Program Director, that's his primary site. And then the two faculty members, Dr. Covell and Smith, are sort of our associate faculty. They're our female pelvic medicine and reconstructive urologists. Um, so you won't work with them all the time, but they do do robots occasionally, sometimes with Phil Muxavage, um, sometimes um, independent. And if that's something you're very interested in, so, you know, things like your reader reimplants, your reader reconstruction, um, robotic sacrocopal plexes, if that's something you find is going to be part of your practice or you want it to be part of your practice, um, then there's opportunities to operate with them as well um, on the robot. So I put them in there for completeness sake. 
for our schedule, I think what's really nice um, that Phil Mock Savage and I have thought long and hard about is balancing your education, the resident's education, as well as what's really important to you um, in terms of getting the most out of this one year. One year is a relatively short period of time. Um, and so we're really trying to maximize that educational value. And as you can see here, this is actually Ben's current schedule for the year. Um, I think Jeff had a slightly different schedule. Ryan had a slightly different schedule as, as things evolve and new faculty come. Um, but this is Ben's current schedule for this academic year. Um, and you can see he's operating with a different person every week. And as I mentioned earlier in one uh, in our sort of pillars or framework is that we want you to be intimately involved with the uh, division. And so, like I said, that does not mean you know, you're tied at the hip to either myself or Phil Muck Savage. We want you to get the experience of how other faculty operate and how they do their cases, as well as the different clinical sites, the staff that are there and support you. Um, that way you get a really good idea of all these different techniques, how to approach cases in different ways. And then when you go out into practice, you can think about uh, maybe the way that Muck Savage does a prostate isn't going to work for this patient. And maybe I should do it the way that Dan Lee does it because of some, you know, disease or that's the way I like it. Or I feel like today the staff can handle the Muck Savage way and not the Dan Lee way. Um, you'll have a lot of tools in your tool belt. Um, and so I, we think that's really important. In addition, we have made it a priority that at least one day a week, um, you have protected academic or educational time. Um, you know, that's not really a time to sort of slack, but that's a time to either think about how you're gonna prepare some sort of educational or teaching session for the residents or medical students, or more likely to be working on your research projects um, over the course uh, of the year. So that way you can be productive and um, get some things published, particularly if you're gonna go into academics, you wanna have those papers coming out right when you sort of finish the year. As many of you know, the lag time between, you know, starting a project and getting it published can be a year or more. So a really great opportunity. We also do have a, a small clinic. Um, and this is really a combination of some return patients as well as some new patients. Like we said, we think it's really important in this transition to get you ready for, for independent practice. So I'll turn it over in one sec to uh, Jeff and, um, and Ryan, but this is just a list of all the fellows that have been trained under our program since 2005, which was the first year. Um, you can see they've landed all over the country, um, a lot obviously in the Northeast, but, but we have uh, fellows kind of sp sprinkled throughout. Um, we have uh, a few in academics as well. Um, and then even Mo, one of our previous fellows is practicing now in Jordan, which is his home country. Um, and so we're very proud of all of them. And then tonight we're fortunate enough to have Ryan and Jeff, um, who took time out of their evening to spend with us and you all. Uh, they are two fellows who kind of went through the program that Phil and I have structured. Uh, Ryan graduated, um, I guess, two academic years now. Jeff was the last academic year. Um, you can see their, their titles here. And um, I'll give them a minute to introduce themselves and sort of talk about um, whatever they feel is appropriate for you guys to know uh, about the program. Uh, maybe I'll start with Ryan because he was the uh, furthest back grad. Go ahead, Ryan. That sounds good. So uh, thanks for taking some time out of your uh, busy schedules and residency. And, um, you know, I think it's great to see how the program has kind of grown um, and continues to develop um, even, uh, even over a couple of years. So I'm, uh, I'm currently the uh, Director of Minimally Invasive Surgery uh, at uh, Cook County Hospital uh, and Health Systems, uh, and then also the Assistant Program Director for our residency program there. Um, you know, I think clinically, uh, or actually one of the reasons that I uh, came to County was to actually start up a robotics program. So we're in the process of uh, getting a robot, and uh, I'm currently doing my open fellowship, and uh, I'm ready to never ever do another open prostate. Uh, again, if I can, uh, uh, the minute that the robot shows up, that'll be really nice. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think some of the other things that I've really uh, appreciated are some of the other things that I think are a little bit unique about the program. Um, you know, I think right now we're doing about 90% of our PCNLs uh, with getting our own access. Um, so we're doing uh, uh, that, which I think has been a really great skill that I picked up from Justin. Um, and uh, something else that uh, kind of brought to the table. Um, and then I think you also, one of the other things that I really appreciate is just the opportunity to um, kind of get some practice being and attending, um, you know, doing kind of teaching, working with the, uh, the residents, operating with the residents, 
um, as well as some of the didactics and kind of, uh, uh, you know, attending call, that kind of thing, where um, you kind of learn how to be an attending uh, with a little bit of training wheels, which I think has been something that uh, you appreciate when you become an attending. Uh, you know, I think some of the other things I think are really uh, that I enjoyed about the program, um, I think, uh, you know, from a research perspective, it's uh, obviously Penn is a very uh, collaborative environment. Um, there's kind of experts in any different kind of field that you're interested in. So if you uh, have a question or, or kind of an itch that you want to scratch, um, there's basically somebody that's an expert in that uh, somewhere at Penn. Um, and I found that people were very willing and helpful uh, to kind of get those projects uh, rolling. Uh, I think we just had a, actually a paper just got accepted last week, um, which is going to be, I think, my 12th paper uh, from fellowship. And I think we have three or four more in the pipeline. Um, so I think if you're, if you're interested in academics, um, it's certainly an environment where, uh, you know, uh, how productive you want to be is, is how productive you can be. Um, and I think that's really nice. Um, you know, some of the other things that uh, I think were really uh, strong, you know, uh, we went to the, back when people traveled for conferences, we went to the World College of Endourology uh, in Abu Dhabi, um, which was a great trip. Uh, Justin uh, was there, uh, and I had a, a, a really nice time at that conference. Um, and then I think you're also, uh, you know, having a great opportunity to kind of develop your skills as a PI. Uh, there's very strong ancillary support for research. Um, from a people perspective, I found it's, uh, you know, it's obviously a very collegial environment. Uh, one of the things that Alan uh, always liked is that kind of the, the department works on a first name basis, um, and he always tries to highlight that as something that I think is kind of unique to Penn Urology. Um, you know, conferences are kind of attended by everybody, or at least, you know, when we had in-person conferences, they were attended by everybody. Um, and so that's been another nice thing, you know, if you have, uh, you know, I uh, have had some cases this year where, you know, uh, I've needed to ask the recon people or, or something like that. And having those kind of relationships and expertise uh, has been also really helpful. Uh, you know, I think finally, uh, you know, Philadelphia is a, a terrific city. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's absolutely fantastic uh, restaurants, uh, you know, kind of any kind of cuisine or any kind of food that you like, uh, it's, uh, it's available. Uh, it's a very reasonable cost of living. Uh, and then it's a very easy city to get around. Uh, I just biked to work for the whole year. Uh, and one of the other nice things that Penn does is they, uh, they actually offer uh, either a free transit pass or a uh, stipend. You know, even if you want to bike to work, they'll like pay for 300 bucks or something a semester uh, for your bike maintenance fees which I thought was really unique, so. Um, but yeah, I think in general, I had a really uh, terrific time. Uh, if anyone has any specific questions or wants to reach out, uh, uh, Justin can share my email and I'm happy to, uh, to talk to anybody individually as well. Thanks. Perfect, thanks, Ryan, really appreciate it. And, and if, uh, yeah, if anyone has questions specific for Ryan right now and wants to pop them in the chat, I'm sure he'll stay for a couple minutes and just check those out while, while Jeff is talking and similarly. Um, so Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Uh, welcome all of you to our open house tonight. Uh, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to talk with you and spread the good word about the Penn Fellowship. Uh, I was the fellow last year and uh, I straddled the transition from the David Lee era uh, to the fellowship in, in close to its current form. Uh, I'm now in private practice in the Philly suburbs, uh, although we do have the mainline health uh, residency program with us. Uh, I have the highest opinion about my year of Penn. Um, if you're looking for a program where you operate a ton, uh, where you'll work through these cases that you've mastered each step as you'll be a skilled and proficient upon graduating, you'll, you'll find that at Penn. Um, as you just saw on the, um, on the schedule, you're operating nearly every day. Uh, you get to work with multiple uh, faculty members, which is a great benefit. It means you're operating more often and you're learning a range of techniques as you'll soon feel like doing these cases a second nature. Uh, if you're from the Philly area, you know that the Penn Autonomy Spains. Uh, these guys will make sure you're being safe and will allow you to uh, have the time to work through the steps to build up the reps that you need. You're not competing with other fellows for cases. Uh, I felt that we had a really great working relationship uh, between the Chiefs and myself, and working together to make sure we were all meeting our objectives. Uh, There's so many cases to go around that I never felt that I was losing out on opportunities. Uh, in addition, the people that you work with are, are really great people to spend the day with. Um, if you're, if you're going to spend a year somewhere, you want to have a positive, happy experience. And, um, and, and your time is valued, and very education oriented. This fellowship doesn't have any kind of busy work component that will eat up your time. 
Uh, most importantly, I wanted to share about how this fellowship prepared me for my career, of course. Um, obviously, right from the start, the reputation of the program goes a long way with the job search, with referring docs, with patients. Um, I've established myself as the robotics guy in the group, um, and I've been confidently booking and doing prostates, kidneys, nephroidectomy, pyeloplasty. Uh, COVID has halted my ability to book PCNLs, but I plan on getting access. Uh, and I know that um, when I'm telling these patients that I'll do their surgery, uh, that I can do the surgery and that I can problem solve when needed. Um, the most important criteria I was looking for in the fellowship was, will this program make me a technically skilled surgeon? And I feel like it did that for me. Another benefit I hadn't anticipated was the teaching aspect. Uh, you'll often be the one teaching a junior resident how to, to do some of these steps, and you learn a lot by teaching. Um, and now that I found myself in the private EMIC setup, it's been very easy to transition to teaching the residents these cases. Um, in conclusion, I think you can tell I have a pretty high opinion about the Penn Fellowship, um, and that's not because the faculty are all on this call. If I were to talk to any of you individually, I wouldn't have any glaring downsides to tell you about. Um, you have the case volume, autonomy, great working environment. I, I would do it again in heartbeat. Uh, I'm grateful to be able to share that with all of you today, and of course, feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank, thanks, Jeff and, and Ryan, of course. Jeff, we, uh, we ordered Starbucks on Friday, and someone said, where's the lemon pound cake? Um, you weren't there. Sorry, buddy. Um, ben, we thought Ben was going to order it, but he, he ordered an apple crisp. I don't know, something. All right, at least ordering food, though. That's important. <laughs> um, uh oh, somehow I muted you, um, uh, Jeff. But uh, I got to figure out how to unmute. I, still unmute. I don't know. Whatever, you're done talking. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go on a little bit. Um, and they're always available for questions as well. So we'll uh, each have the faculty introduce themselves. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Philly as well, because I think that's really important. You're going to spend a year here. It's, uh, it's good to know. Uh, we would have liked, obviously, people to come and visit and spend time with us for a day or two, uh, get to know the program, uh, get to know the city. Uh, that's not really feasible this year. We thought it would be. But as you know, that's not possible. So we'll, we'll introduce ourselves and then uh, I'll, I'll bring it back and talk a little bit about Philly and then we'll get Ben on the line um, and we'll close it out. So I already introduced myself, Justin Ziamba. I'm the fellowship program director, took over for David Lee a couple of years ago, two years ago, I guess now. Uh, my clinical focus is primarily uh, kidney stones. Uh, so ureteroscopy, PCNL, we, we basically do all our own access here between me and Phil Mox Savage. Um, who, who's up next um, and will introduce himself. Uh, so we're very fortunate that we have a high volume of complex kidney stones. Uh, both Phil and I also do the medical management um, from, from time to time, depending on um, who the patient is and, and what um, other uh, comorbidities they have. Uh, but we're also fortunate enough here, uh, we're actually one of the few academic centers that actually has a group of nephrologists who spend a significant portion of their time doing medical management. And so we work very closely with them uh, on those complex patients. A lot of patients who have transplanted stones, a lot of patients who come over from CHOP on Age Out, which is our pediatric hospital across directly across the street. Um, they all have significant genetic or other comorbid medical conditions that make it from a urology perspective, very challenging to manage from a medication standpoint. Um, and so we're very fortunate enough to work collaboratively with them. Uh, and that's something that's very exciting. Uh, in addition to the, to the surgical and, and medical aspect of kidney stones, my other area of focus is I do research on that, primarily quality of life research. Uh, also have some federally funded and PCORI research with my colleague, Greg Tation, who's a pediatric kidney stone specialist at CHOP. Um, and we have a number of programs uh, that we're working on. Ben is helping us with a machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, project, looking at CT scans and stone passage. Um, and then I also work on safety and quality for the health system. Uh, so have a, a fairly uh, wide portfolio there, um, but that's what I do. Um, and so from my perspective, uh, you know, I'm the fellowship director, but you know, you're only with me one day a week working on basically your percutaneous access. And then as Jeff uh, mentioned, uh, you know, whenever possible, trying to teach the junior residents, um, you know, your ureteroscopy. Um, you know, I didn't realize when I was doing my fellowship, I came out of Penn from residency and thought I was, you know, amazing at ureteroscopy. And then I got into fellowship and I was, well, maybe there's some stuff I can actually learn. Um, and I feel like that's probably a process that repeats itself, um, that there are some tips and tricks really to not make you necessarily 
safer, you're probably all safe coming out of residency, but to making you more efficient and more effective um, so that, you know, you could probably squeeze one more case out, you know, when you get out in the practice, because you're much better over the course of the year on ureteroscopy. And then, of course, percutaneous access is its own beast. And that takes most of the year to be competent enough to be able to do that in practice and feel like you can get yourself in, get yourself into the kidney safely, and then troubleshoot any issues that arise during the access part. Um, so that's it for me. I will turn it over to Phil Mock Savage. Um, Phil, go ahead. Phil, you're muted, or maybe oh, it's you your is you it, unmuted is me. <laughs> is your beard in the way? <clears throat> yeah. It's getting a little gnarly now. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it's a COVID beard. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Phil Moak Savage. Um, so I was a uh, Penn Penn resident. I actually went to undergrad at Penn as well. Um, I did my uh, medical school training at uh, Columbia, and then I went out to Irvine with uh, Ralph Clayman and Jamie Landman to do um, some of the uh, endo urology uh, fellow. My endo urology fellowship. So I was out there for two years. Um, so my practice really encompasses all of endourology, which I think is fantastic. I will do, um, I see a lot of patients that no one else wants to see or take care of a lot of the complex stone patients. Uh, although I've tried to dump some of those on Justin every so often, um, as well as some of the minimally invasive, uh, uh cancer operations, uh, reconstructive operations that I do with Dr. Covell. You know, we're, we're building a group of these uh, reconstructive ureteral cases with buccal mucosa, as well as other techniques. Um, and then uh, some of the, I dabble a little bit into the bladder, intracorporal uh, diversions, uh, that kind of stuff. Although, you know, now that we have more oncologists um, that are much more facile at that, I've, I've kind of uh, I've given up some of that air, uh, some of those uh, volumes. Um, I am based mainly at Pennsylvania Hospital, which is, uh, it's more of our community-based hospital. Um, and so I, we see, I see a diverse kind of a, a group of patients. Um, you know, a lot of, some of, some basic endourology, uh, basic uro or, uh, general urology. Um, so, you know, there, there's terps and, and things like that in there, as well as some, um, you know, benign disease. Um, <clears throat> Justin and I, you know, since we've trained in different areas or di different uh, locations for our fellowship, uh, do our perk access a little bit differently. Um, he's more of a standard uh, retrograde access. Uh, I do a lot of the endoscopic access with the split leg table, uh, putting a U-scope up. And, and I think that's actually a, a kind of a, a unique and uh, great feature of our program is that you'll see, uh, as Justin mentioned before, you know, different ways to, to skin a cat um, so that you're, you'll be facile at doing uh, things differently uh, if needed. Uh, much of my research is outcomes-based. Um, you know, I, I, I'm more of a clinical-based uh, guy as well as more education. I run the medical student education at, uh, at Pennsylvania Hospital. Um, we also have a, a fairly extensive simulation lab. Um, it's a little bit off-site, and there's actually a sim fellow through, um, through general surgery. Um, so, you know, I will dabble a little bit in that because that was part of my fellowship. Um, so we, we run simulation, uh, some simulation training as well as uh, some labs and things like that. But if, if you have an interest in, in simulation, there's certainly areas uh, um, and a lot of research opportunities, kind of low-lying fruit, uh, especially for fellows uh, to get involved in. Um, and then um, I think that's uh, really about it. And uh, you know, usually the fellows with me a couple of days more, um, you know, for operating on the robot, but, you know, obviously we have a little bit of fluidity so that, so that people can see uh, different ways, uh, you know, treating stones, as I said before, uh, or um, uh, robotic uh, techniques. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, I think you highlighted some good points in addition to the, um, you know, we put up Ben's schedule for this year, uh, but there is some slight opportunity for some customization, depending on, you know, your personal interests as the fellow. If you needed a little bit more perk access and, you know, your readeroscopy time, because that's where you're headed for your career, we could fit that in with Phil and myself. Um, if you are more interested in, you know, upper tracts, uh, then, you know, we try to get as much time as we can on those who are doing kidneys, less on the prostate. Um, so, so some, some opportunity for customization there, which is nice because although you're an integral member of the team, um, uh, you know, if you're not present for some reason, cause you do need to do research on a given day, that's, um, 
that's we, we can certainly accommodate that. So that's what's another nice feature about this program. Uh, all right, let's see who's next. Tom Guzzo is up next. He's our uh, division chief. Hopefully he's still on. Looks like he is. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank, thank you for coming. I'm Tom Guzzo, as Justin said. Uh, I'm the chief of urology at Penn. Um, I trained at Penn as well. I uh, graduated from residency in 2007, I guess. Um, I went on to Hopkins and did a oncology fellowship and then came back on staff in 09. Um, I took over as division in 2017. Um, you know, as far as the fellowship goes, the, the, my, my major contribution is robotics cases. Um, about 80% of what I do clinically is, is minimally invasive at this point. Um, all on the oncology side, with the exception, I also do um, robotic simple prostatectomy. Um, I have a pretty high volume surgical practice, um, which I think is a benefit to, to the fellows that, that work with me. Um, I do, you know, roughly about 450 robotic procedures a year. Um, and I'm with the fellow every other Tuesday mostly centered around um, robotic prostatectomy and robotic uh, partial and radical nephrectomy, um, again, with some benign prostatectomy sprinkled in and some robotic cystectomy as well. Um, I typically run two robotic rooms in a staggered fashion, um, and I think it's really a nice thing for the fellow. Um, and, and, you know, I guess Ben... Um, could certainly speak to that, um, as well as Jeff. Uh, the way I currently run it is essentially there's a chief, uh, a, a chief in a chief resident in one of the rooms and a fellow in the other room. So when you're there on my Tuesdays, you're essentially um, the primary surgeon in that in that robotic room, um, typically doing two robots that day. Um, I'm extremely supportive of Justin and Phil and the fellowship in general. Um, you know, my personal opinion is the fellowship um, has changed a lot over the last two years and really substantially for the better. Um, not, not to knock it before, but I really truly feel that, that Justin and Phil have invested an incredible amount of thought and energy into the fellowship. And it's, extremely well-rounded, um, not only clinically, but academically. Um, you also have wide enough room to carve out your own niche from a personal interest standpoint, again, clinically and academically. Um, culturally, um, I'm a huge believer in, in the way we do things at Penn. Um, you know, I think there's an extreme amount of collegiality between faculty between faculties and, and fellows, um, between the fellow and the residents and, and, you know, point the arrows, whichever, which way you want to point them. And, and I think it makes it a really nice learning and working environment. And I think uh, by and large people like to come into work each day, which I think makes it a lot easier to, to actually learn and, and do what you want to do. Um, so, you know, I think that's all I got, but, uh, think it's an outstanding place to spend a year training. Thanks, Tom. Um, appreciate that. I would, I would echo that, you know, you know, some day, some days are harder than others, but, but most days, uh, particularly in the operating room, uh, the, the pen culture, uh, is very, um, loose is probably the wrong word. Uh, but in the operating room, you know, people do have a good time in between cases, um, you know, we're doing the work is serious, but there's a lot of laughs, a lot of smiles, um, for the most part, uh, between us, the residents, the fellow and, you know, the nurses and surgical techs and, and everyone who participates. So, um, that is, a, I think a unique aspect that doesn't exist everywhere. Um, I can only speak where I did my fellowship at Hopkins and, and Phil Parazio was recently a faculty member there. And so he can comment on this as well. But I, but I find the operating rooms uh, to be much more uh, enjoyable and less stoic 
um, a lot more emotions, uh, both positive and negative, but uh, that's usually a good thing. Um, so let's see who we got next. So Dan, I don't think is on. He texted me a little while ago. He got stuck in a case um, that is going longer than expected. So he is not here. He um, is mostly at uh, Presbyterian, but does operate at HUP as well. Um, he is a urologic oncologist, so did his fellowship in, in uh, an SUO fellowship, uh, but does a lot of robots similar to Tom Guzzo's practice. Um, and so you'll be working with him similarly on the minimally invasive part of oncology. Um, he does disparities research, outcomes research, um, uh, some big data research, uh, health services. Um, so there is some opportunity there if, uh, if you're interested. And um, uh, not much else I can say about him because, uh, you know, he's a, he's a great person to work with. And I wish he was here to, to showcase that himself. But um, that's kind of him, him in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Phil because Phil is here tonight. So, Phil P. Good. Um, thanks for uh, having me and thanks everybody for, for showing up tonight. So, as uh, Justin and everybody said, I'm one of the newest faculty members here at Penn. I spent the last almost 15 years at, at Hopkins, both training and then on faculty. So, um, I am uh, David Lee's successor at, at Presbyterian. And just to kind of give you the, the goal of that hospital, as I said, it's a smaller hospital in terms of beds, but it's a large hospital in terms of volume and urology volume. Um, we are one of the main services or service lines at that hospital. And the goal over the next few years is to kind of um, maintain or build surgical volume, particularly in robotics and particularly in kind of a more comprehensive oncology service line. So both Dan and I will be operating there, um, running, uh, the goal is multiple rooms, multiple times a week, doing high volume urologic oncology, minimally invasive and open cases. Obviously you guys would be involved in the robotics uh, program and lap laparoscopy cases when we do that as well. Um, I would just say kind of clinically, it is always my greatest pleasure as we get towards the end of rotations or towards the end of the year to be able to watch fellows and residents operate together and be able to see them do complex urologic oncology cases. And I can just kind of chime in or not chime in and just kind of watch and, and see how you guys progress. And that is one of my greatest joys. From an academic standpoint, you're obviously, if you come, you're welcome to work with me as much or as little as you want. Uh, obviously, doing do a ton of research, particularly in kidney cancer, um, upper tract urothelial cancer, um, and germ cell tumors. So you're more than welcome to get involved in anything that you would like to. And I would say, lastly, just as a uh, of interest, you know, one of the as I said, one of the real interests, clinical interests at Presbyterian Hospital is to build not only the comprehensive urologic oncology program, but really a a formal robotics program, which could potentially scale out. So our goal is to acquire at least two more systems in the next six to 12 months, build out not only the urology robotics program, but the other service lines as they want more access to, to uh, robots. And with that comes leadership opportunities and learning how to formally develop program, you know, robotic programs, things we've done before, things we've done at Hopkins, and things we're gonna bring here and hopefully scale out across the system. So that's, uh, that's my spiel. Great, thanks. Thanks, Phil. Um... So these are our two associate faculty uh, who are not on tonight. Um, as I mentioned previously, they're both at Pennsylvania Hospital, um, which is the site that you'll operate with Phil Mock Savage. Um, he occasionally does cases with them in a joint fashion and they do them independently. So, you know, if, if you want to sort of make reconstructive robotic urology a part of your practice, um, there's an opportunity here. Obviously, that is um, a relatively minor niche overall in urology and something would be very difficult to make solely your practice. But if you wanted to feel competent in doing some of these re-implants, uh, ureteral reconstruction, sacrocopal pexies, things like that, um, this is a, another uh, great selling point of the program where you can gain the, those skills. Um, Phil, any comments on that? Because you occasionally do cases with, uh, with, with Caleb. Yeah, so um, in the last few years, Caleb has, uh, he was mainly an open reconstructive uh, urologist, and we've uh, kind of incorporated a lot of the robotic aspect to that. Um, so we'll do kind of the crazy, stupid stuff. Uh, ben, the, the current uh, fellow, usually brings some kind of paper somewhere and says, hey, should we try this? And we'll say, 
we've already done that or yeah let's give it a shot <laughs> so <laughs> it's usually we've already done that it doesn't work or something like that um but he's really added a lot to the uh, reconstructive type aspect um it's a small area it's you know this i mean obviously you're here for uh stones minimally invasive it's not a, a reconstructive fellowship but we certainly have a little bit of that and i think you're going to be doing some of that if you're if you do uh, endo urology anywhere and then dr smith she's probably the world's best uh, or one of the you know regional probably country maybe even world's best uh female urologist again you're here you don't want to do female urology there's it's not a female urology fellowship but she certainly does some of the robotic uh re um uh, female cases and, and Ben certainly has gotten involved in that. Um, it's a small aspect. Um, you know, again, if, if you're more interested in that, you probably shouldn't be looking at this program. Uh, it, it should be more of a female uh, program, but it's something nice because, uh, you know, people going into private practice and maybe Jeff can talk about that is you have that opportunity to do robotic sacral cobalt pexies um, and uh, some of the minimally invasive um, reconstructive things for for female and, and she's just a great teacher and you know i think her experience on the robot um is not as vast as some of the other faculty so she kind of relies on the, the fellow to to help her with with some of that so i think that's a great opportunity to learn thanks phil um so i think we'll take a, just a couple minutes uh many of you may have been to philadelphia some of you have not um and so I thought we would uh, highlight some of the amazing things that Philly has to offer. So I was talking to uh, Gretchen, who's my administrative assistant, and Laura, who's Tom Guzzo's administrative assistant. Um, they both sit across from me um, outside my office. And so we were trying to brainstorm what are the uh, best highlights we can uh, put out here for Philadelphia that we can cover in two minutes. Uh, so we went with the historical aspect, which is, uh, this is the birthplace of America and the birthplace of democracy. It's a shot of the Liberty Bell, which you can walk by and look at. You can tour Independence Hall, Constitution uh, Center, um, the Revolutionary War Museum. So a lot of great, great history, which uh, most of that is free or very cheap. Um, and so that's very exciting. Um, you know, you're kind of part of that, but you're also part of uh, medical history. I think it's something like uh, 20 or 30 percent of all doctors in the United States have trained in Philadelphia um, at any given time. Uh, it might be more than that, but it's a substantial number. And uh, Pennsylvania Hospital, uh, which I mentioned before, is the nation's first hospital uh, started by Benjamin Rush um, in the late 1700s. Um, so a great historical uh, track record we have not just in our fellowship, but in medicine in general. And then of course we have the cheesesteak. Everybody loves a cheesesteak until you have a cheesesteak and then you kind of get grossed out of yourself. And then you wait a couple of days and you're like, I'll do that again. Um, so, so that's uh, one of our other selling points. And then of course, Rocky, that's the Rocky statue at the art museum, which you can run up the stairs and then wait in a long line to take a picture of the Rocky statue, um, which I'm not sure why people like to do that, but it's entertaining. Um, so we're also the birthplace of Rocky. And then we were looking up to see, you know, what, what's the kind of hottest, latest trends. Uh, I moved out of the city two years ago, so I've lost touch with the latest trends, but uh, Laura and Gretchen both um, are constantly involved in the scene, uh, obviously a little less so with the pandemic, but um, you can see at the top there that Philly is one of the hottest cities in the country. Um, and they put in there where you can still afford to buy a home, which is becoming less true as time goes on. But uh, it's still a very affordable city, as um, I think Ryan mentioned, a very livable um, and easy to commute city. Uh, it's a historical city. So for most of the places uh, you would live as a fellow uh, is going to be, you know, bikeable or public transportation or even car um, or walking distance to a lot of the activities you want to do. Um, also a great food scene that's exploded in the last five to 10 years. Um, you know, I, I went to medical school here as well a while back, and, and back then there wasn't nearly as much to do as there is today. Um, similarly, with the bar scene, which kind of goes with the food scene, a lot of the places are, you know, sort of these, um, you know, uh, mom and pop, you know, 10, 12 tables, great food, um, craft cocktails, that kind of stuff. Um, so very exciting, um, a real highlight of the city. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any uh any of the other faculty or Ben, Jeff, Ryan, I know 
Ben might talk about how he is renting a house in South Philly um, and got swindled into participating in the massive uh, annual Christmas ritual where you have to massively decorate your house with lights um, and basically spend his entire fellow salary on uh, electricity and lights. Uh, but he did get to be on the local news for about 90 seconds with his kids. So I would say it was all worth it at the end. Um, he will not be eating for the rest of the year, but it was worth it for that, for that 90 seconds of fame. Um, so that's kind of Philly in a nutshell. The other things that are really interesting that you may not know of, um, besides the Eagles, which you probably do, and they just got crushed. But uh, this is a huge sports city. Um, you can do the Eagles chant any day or night at any other sporting event, and people will participate. I find it very fascinating that you can do the Eagles chant at a Phillies game, and half the stadium will participate. Um, and so they love their sports. Uh, this is always a tough week after Philly crashes out of the playoffs. Everyone's morale is lower um, all across the workplace. Um, I'm not a Phillies, um, Eagles or Phillies fan, but uh, it's palpable that people are disappointed the week after a loss. Philly actually boasts the largest uh, par uh, park within a city, so bigger than Central Park. Um, and so that's a great place. Like this is one of the shots um, from, from the park. Um, I don't know how many acres it is, but it's massive. You can do hikes and you wouldn't even know that you're in the city um, and it's great. And then they have a, a growing art scene um both uh both from you know painting at the art museum but also all the broadway shows come through here and then we're obviously very regionally uh co-located with baltimore dc uh boston's a little further away but certainly new york city and uh the jersey shore um so a lot of great uh touch points for when you do have time off um particularly if you're coming with a significant other or or, or children um, a lot of opportunities, and I'm sure Ben can talk about that because he has young children as well um, and what he does. So I'll turn it over to Ben. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining in tonight. Um, so, yeah, I'm Ben Schurhammer. I'm the current fellow um, here at Penn. And so, yeah, that's just kind of my background there. Um, so, yeah, anyways, uh, I can't just, you know, underscore everything that everyone said tonight. Um, and I, I guess if I would kind of focus on a few things, you know, one, you know, I think pretty much all the faculty and, and Ryan and Jeff said it, it's just the, the Penn culture is just a really special and unique thing. Um, high autonomy, uh, high volume, um, lots of people working together and, um, and really just not that, that kind of stoic um, thought process at all here, uh, kind of as Justin had underscored, you know, Alan Wien, was previously the division chief and I think he kind of had set that culture in place it seems like and, and Tom and the rest of the people that in the faculty have really kept that going on and so you know walking in first day calling Alan Weed by his first name when you see his name you know on the cover of uh, Campbell Walsh I mean, is certainly kind of humbling but I think it kind of sets the tone for um, just the the fellowship and the people there in general and so I think that that culture you know, carries into just the educational aspect um, where, you know, you are brought in as a team member, you are respected and, um, and really kind of the sky's the limit. You know, Ryan wrote 12 papers. Uh, that's really impressive. Good for you. <laughs> uh, working on that. And um, Jeff, I don't, did you write 12? But uh, anyways, the, from a research perspective, you know, lots to do there. Um, Certainly amongst all the faculty members that are listed here, um, you know, Justin, Phil, uh, Dan, Tom, uh, Phil Pierazio. Um, and then, you know, there's also, you know, lots of contributing, um, you know, uh, different departments that also help out. So as Justin kind of mentioned with nephrology, um, I've kind of dabbled a little bit with the Precision Surgery Institute. So there's, there's just so many resources here at Penn. It's just, um, it's, so it's unreal. Um, you know, probably as as you're discovering, as you kind of go through this interview and open house season, um, you know, these these uh, fellowships kind of fall into a few different categories. Some of them are more of like the apprenticeship model. So where you're just with one person pretty much all the time. And then, you know, this this is a very different model where you're, you know, spread um, throughout with with different faculty members. And, um, you know, I guess you just kind of have to decide which what you think would work best for you. There's definitely pros and cons to each, um, you know, having kind of interviewed at both. I, I liked the idea of a, of a department with, with a diversity of faculty members. Um, one, 
just it was kind of scary maybe just to commit to one person per year if I didn't really know them all that well. Uh, but two, I mean, there's just so many things that you learn. Um, you know, it's as Phil Pirazu had mentioned, it's it's fun to kind of watch him build that robotics program over there at Penn Presbyterian Hospital and just kind of learn about how you manage a fleet. Um, can you buy the robots? Can you lease the robots? You know, just so many things that you wouldn't necessarily kind of fall outside of the scope of of how to do a bladder neck in, in the OR. So, um, so many kind of unanticipated uh, learning goals there. Third thing, I guess, would say just the, the residents and, and the medical students to some degree, but um, you know, residents definitely kind of fall within that culture. They're so respectful, uh, nice, good, and prepared. And, um, and as the other guys have kind of mentioned, it's fun to kind of get your feet wet with kind of being in and attending you know, talking through cases with them, stents, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, helping off the faculty members kind of on an as needed basis with cases. So stent comes in, we'll do it. Claudiovac comes in, you know, I'll do it. And that definitely kind of helps out the team, uh, moves the day along. And then, you know, kind of lets, I feel like the more you invest in other people, the, the more they'll invest in you. And, um, and yeah, and, you know, just to kind of underscore, you know, we're just, we're busy enough here where I think, you know, everyone's happy. Uh, no one's worried about the fellow kind of like, quote unquote, stealing cases per se, you know, I think that in a lot of ways you can, um, hard to maybe imagine now, but you can definitely enhance the learning um, of the residents around you. And um, and so now that we're kind of to the latter half of the year, we're, you know, just figuring out ways for to incorporate the younger, you know, residents on the robot. Um, so does that mean bedsiding for, um, you know, an hour while PGY3 drops the bladder? You know, it's, um, you know, just kind of, certain things to, to kind of help and um, and kind of pass along what's what's been invested in us. So, um, you yeah, know, just can't uh, underscore all the things that everyone else said and and uh, I promise they're, they're telling the truth. And, um, and yeah, uh, I guess last thing is, you know, Philadelphia, I think Justin alluded to it and, and Jeff Walker and I were talking to it about this previously because he's actually from the area, but, you know, you're an hour from the beach, you're an hour from New York City, you're an hour from the Poconos Mountains, few hours from DC. And so you just have so much here uh, and accessible that it, um, you know, there's just, you you will never be bored on the weekend. And then we have all like the fancy restaurants and and then the cheese steak. Like there's just, there there's so much here. And, and the moment you kind of feel like you've seen it all, then there's just so much more. So I've, I'm married, I have a wife and, and a few, three kids. And, um, you know, we've been able to move to the city and, you um, and live, you know, um, in a row house and, um, and, and survive. And I don't know how many other kind of large metropolitan areas of the size where you can do that and still have like a 10, 10 minute commute to the hospital. So um, I think for those of you that applied, you know, Justin had CC'd me on the email and I've, I've gotten a chance to speak with a good amount of you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, good point, uh, Phil Piorazio. So I've good, gotten a good chance to speak to the amount of you, but uh, if anyone else has questions, you know, of course, um, you know, respond to that email and I'd be happy to, to line up the time to chat. Thanks, Ben. Um, so we're, we're happy. I think that's all I have, uh, Q&A, and this is all our contact information. 